views and opinions expressed did not necessarily reflect those of Access Fort Wayne, the Allen County Public Library, or any other supporting groups. If you'd like to produce a show, call us at I'm Dr. Rudy Cashman, neurosurgeon, Far Wayne, Indiana, 41 years, but I'm only 39 years old. Well, besides being a neurosurgeon, uh, I've noticed over the last 30, 40 years that I've uh, practiced that 75% of the patients uh, that I'm looking at really is a physical presentation of stress. In other words, they don't need to be treated with injections uh, and with uh, surgery. They can be treated more gently, but that's not really what I'm witnessing uh, in the community. So that's the reason I'm doing the, the show today called Doctor Second Opinion. They, very many medical conditions uh, are worth, frankly, a second opinion. Uh, just be, there are just honest differences of opinion about how something should be treated, like a back problem, for example. Uh, you might have therapy or chiropractor or surgery or injection. So there's a lot of different ways. So if you can't make your mind, it's another opinion, you know, it's important. So I'm going to cover this subject uh, and go through a number of illnesses where I think it really would be worthwhile. Uh, and, uh, for example, questions you maybe ought to ask yourself. And these first few questions, why don't we rate them 1 to 10? And then write it on a piece of paper and keep track. How serious is my condition? Is this life-threatening? Uh, could I become paralyzed? Or is this just a quick fix? Ask yourself, is this a quick fix? We're going to do this major operation or procedure or injection or medication because I'm unwilling to participate in my own health care. I don't want to lose weight. I don't want to exercise. Is that the case? Then you ought to you know, take that into consideration. What are the odds I don't need this? Frankly, uh, a number of uh, procedures that people have, just question about it. For example, a, a gallbladder operation, a back operation, there can be differences of opinion. I've even seen a difference of opinion, believe it or not, in a heart transplant. Yeah, you wouldn't believe it. I'll discuss that a little bit later. So what are the odds? Put down a number for yourself. How important is condition in my life? Am I just getting a quick fix here? Or is this life-threatening to me? Uh, then, you know, you have to get more serious about this. Maybe gather some opinions, you know, if you have time. So give that a rating. And uh, do I trust the doctor? Does he own the surgery center? Does he own the equipment? Is this a specialty hospital? Do they do only back surgery here? What do you think if you go to a specialty hospital, they're going to do? Odds are they're going to promote uh, their specialty, whether it be a heart uh, place. I remember going to visit somebody at a heart hospital. Uh, and, uh, and I spoke to the doctors about the books I've written about wellness and avoiding uh, heart procedures as an, another alternative. And, uh, and uh, I wanted him to send uh, the patient that he was treating, the person I was going there to help, to uh, try perhaps some conservative uh, management, a wellness center, or a place that would instruct the patient. I, he couldn't name a place. Mind you, he works in the major heart hospital, and in that heart hospital in Indianapolis, they did not have a wellness center. And if you ate the food that was in the cafeteria, you'd gain weight, maybe even cause a heart attack. Do you get my point? Do you get my point? So you've got to know, where am I at? Where am I located at? And I give that a rating. Do I like the person? You know, I talk a lot about in my lectures about the placebo effect. If you believe that alone has a 70% chance of helping you, even if the procedure didn't do anything. So to have faith in your provider is very important. You have to like your provider. That's a placebo effect of the provider. That's a real thing. It's a real thing. If you feel negative 
the, about the provider. That's a nocebo. I'll explain that later. That's a negative thing. So uh, you don't want that. Do I have doubt? You know, give that a rating, 1 to 10. What do I have to lose if I go across town to get another opinion? Kind of think about it. Is the money involved? Time involved? Is this an emergency? So let's give that a, a rating. Uh, are there a lot of different ways to treat this condition? That's kind of important. If it's a heart condition, maybe a diet would do. If it's not an emergency, maybe it's a back problem, maybe conservative treatment, uh, a hot shower, a hot bath, a, a chiropractor, a masseuse, uh, exercising yourself, participating in your wellness, going to the Y. That, that may kill you. So let's give that a rating. Uh, I don't know what to do. Give that a rating. Uh, let's add the points up. You, you might be too old to have this procedure. You know, he is 80 years old and they're going to do a triple bypass. You know, maybe you ought to seek another opinion. Uh, if they're going to fix an aortic leak or an aortic valve, that might be more emergent. So you ought to know how important this is to your life at age 80. I mean, if you don't have this, you're going to die in a week. Well, maybe you ought to have it done. But, uh, but if there are alternative ways of dealing with it, uh, but that not includes operations, but medication. You're 80 years old and you're 15 medications. Wait a minute. I see a lot of that. Most of, I would say, maybe at best need three or four. So you need to know, maybe get some other opinions. Not just stop the medicine, but get some other opinions. Actually, I've seen some pretty darn good results. Good results. But an 85-year-old said, I'm not going to take these 15 pills and took one, and he's healthy as can be. So I'm not suggesting that, but I'm saying I have seen it. And uh, considering the cost, is it worth it? Give it a rating. Is the standard of treatment, is this standard of treatment, or is it experimental? You need to find that out. Are you part of a research group and they didn't tell you about it, or making you sign forms uh, that try and things out on you? You need to have, give that a rating. And, uh, but don't drag out the process. If your life is threatened, work quickly, and, and not the day of surgery. But even life-threatening things, you can demand a second opinion. They ought to be provided in most big hospitals Within, within an hour or so, uh, if you feel like that's, uh, you know, uh, what you need. There are some other questions you'd ask yourself, and uh, you don't nece necessarily need to give the, these a rating, uh, but the other ones you can total it up and see, and see where you're at. And uh, what else is being done to treat this condition besides surgery? You ought to ask yourself that. Are there other things that can be done? Uh, is conservative treatment? chiropractic treatment, go into a wellness center like our own. Uh, if you're having uh, uh, this light angina, it comes and goes, it isn't a major threat. I heard Dr. Caldwell Esseltine say at a lecture last Friday, I went to Anderson, I heard him in person, who, he wrote that famous book, Preventing, Stopping, and Reversing Heart Disease. He, he, he says eating a high-dense nutrient diet, uh, way of uh, eating uh, could remove angina within two or three weeks, you know? That might be worth it versus an angiogram or angioplasty. Yeah. What are the negatives uh, of, your, of not doing something or of the medication? What are the side effects of the injection? What are the side effects? Is the injection the key to unlock the door to get narcotics? And now you're going to be a narcotic addict? You need to know that. Look around the waiting room. What are you looking at? A bunch of addicted people or healthy looking people? And, uh, where will they have the treatment? It's important to know. Is it, is it outpatient? Are you going to have a major spine operation? It's an outpatient center not attached to a hospital. You've got to worry about that. Uh, you, you're going to have something done in the dental office where they put you asleep or uh, half asleep. They're going to work on your teeth. You better be with an experienced individual. He's not used to giving semi-anesthesia. There's a risk located there because if you have a cardiac arrest, this is not a hospital. They're not going to jump on your chest and resuscitate you like they would in a hospital with a team of five or six people. Dr. Blue, that's what that means. They're going to call Dr. Blue in the dental office. I don't think it's going to be that simple. And uh, have there been valid studies in its effectiveness? Have there been double-blind studies? A lot of back fusions today have never had double-blind studies. They're done anyway. Uh, so you need to know, know that. Where can I get more information? Reading a book, DVDs, CDs online. I provide all of that for my patients. I get CD, DVDs, uh, uh, books, TV show, and, and now I have audio books where you can listen for hours on a subject that might interest you, like losing weight, type 2 diabetes, 
seven hours I have on, on audiobooks. On chronic pain, which I think is important the subject, I have 10 hours that you can listen to in your car. You might want to listen to that before uh, they inject your back. I have, a, yeah, I have five DVDs on chronic pain all put together on one CD you could listen to. And just think of that, the information handed out to you maybe for 10 bucks. Uh, that might save you a lot of trouble. Can I take medication instead of having surgery? Now, there's a thought for you. Medications have side effects, so you need to go to the side effects. How long do I have to be on it? Or maybe I could try medication for two or three weeks. I get a pain down my leg, but I'm not paralyzed, I'm not numb. You might try a steroid uh, for a, uh, a week or two, and maybe take it away. I've seen them many times. And uh, so how does medication compare to an operation? You need to know that information. And uh, how long will I have to take the medication? Do you have to be on it for five years? That gets expensive. Uh, you could have side effects, so you need to know that. Uh, how much of this will I have to pay out of pocket? That's a good question. Uh, you're going to end up with a $5,000 bill, $30,000 bill, $100,000 bill. Uh, if conservative management might get you well, uh, which would be true for significant number of heart procedures, significant number of back procedures, which I'm familiar with, uh, even some abdominal procedure. Does that gallbladder need to be removed? Uh, recently, I had a patient of mine. I'm walking through the pre-surgical area, and she's a fibromyalgia patient. Uh, generally, they can be treated conservatively. And I said, Jane, what are you doing here? She says, I've had my gallbladder removed. And I said, where's the pain? She pointed to her bladder. That's not where the gallbladder is. And, and she was a, had a lot of mind-body illnesses to begin with, so I suspect that gallbladder disappeared for not a very good reason. So it's good to get opinions. Uh, could the medication interact with other pills I'm taking? That's kind of important to know. And uh, can you tell me about any studies that have been done on the treatment of my condition through medication? The doctor ought to know. If he doesn't, you should be concerned. Uh, is there anything else I should know about the pros and cons of going this route? Good questions. And remember, the standard of care is not always the best care, contrary to what you might think. Remember, the gold standard treatment of the condition that has been there for years may turn into rust like tarnished silver. For example, let me give you an example. Uh, Dr. Halstead recommended radical mastectomy for breast cancer uh, over 100 years ago. For 100 years, that was the standard of treatment. Till a doctor at the Cleveland Clinic uh, read a study uh, where, where only a small part of the breast was, was removed uh, for uh, the majority of cases, and guess what? Outcomes were the same. So just because it's the gold standard for decades does not prove it's the best and only treatment. Be open-minded is all I am saying. A very interesting thing, especially the story about Dr. Halstead and the uh, breast condition. That story was told by Dr. Caldwell Esseltine at his lecture last, last uh, uh, Friday. Let's delve into the medical system a little further, the industrial uh, complex. And this gets sort of compl complex and sort of uh, uh, interesting. And uh, let's talk about corporate profits. What is medicine uh, today? We have private hospitals uh, that are owned by corporations. Uh, the system I'm part of, at least 50 hospitals. I went to a place in Naples, Florida that, uh, that's also part of about uh, 50 hospitals. And they depend, frankly, on profits. They need to keep the stock price up. I went to a hospital in, in Naples, Florida, because I wanted to bring a wellness center there. And the CEO uh, said to me, he says, Rudy, you don't get it. I said, what do you, what do you mean, Scott? He said, I have to worry about the stock price. I have to worry about paying dividends. I have no interest in wellness. He might as well put a spear through my heart. I'm a wellness doctor. I couldn't believe it. I could not believe it that he would admit it to me. We, most of us suspect it. My point is, what's a patient to do? What's a patient to do? Get a second opinion. That's what there is to do because I get the feeling at that point, we're a commodity. We're a commodity. If they don't do something to me, they make no money. If they get me well, they make no money. No wonder insurance companies, and I don't know why they think this way, 
Yeah. Don't pay for wellness. Why wouldn't they pay for wellness? We'd save them all kind of money. Maybe they can't raise their fees. I don't have any idea. I go over there, but they, they will not. Occasionally now they're doing it. Occasionally a little bit. They'll pass out 100 or 200 dollars. But they'll pay 100000 for a back procedure. They're like that. Hard operation, 150000 bucks when you add it all up for months of hospitalization sometimes. They'll pay it. But to uh, pay for uh, a membership to the Y or to my wellness center, they, they don't pay for that. It's kind of instinct. So corporate profits play into this. They pay dividends. They worry about stock price. And you know in some, some hospitals today, uh, many hospitals today, that, that they own the doctors now. But do they pay the, the doctors a salary? No. They pay him by what he does. If he does X procedures, he gets X salary. If he does no procedures, he gets a very low salary. What does that do? Promote corporate, corporate profits, uh, of course. And I think when there was health care reform recently, uh, I think they sold out to the community of profit hospitals. What's a bit unfortunate is the non-for-profits, like we have in this town, are starting to act like for-profits. They're not staying in the inner city with their major big new hospitals they're building. They're building them out in the countryside. They're supposed to be the ones that don't pay taxes and, and, and provide some charity, which they do, but also does the for-profit hospital in town. They're acting the same. One pays taxes, one doesn't pay taxes. They're, they're acting like they're, they're twins. How much money they spend, for example, advertising in the newspapers is beyond human belief. We could do a lot of great free work with that money or charge people less for having things done. So medical corporations are a huge part of the medical complex. and We are facing uh, the, the industrial complex. Corporate profits are important. So that's the reason, uh, that's the reason I'm writing a, a book on second opinions and I'm doing this, this, uh, this uh, uh, show. But it also is affecting research. You know, you used to read the New England Journal and the doctors doing the research there were not paid by any drug company or instrument company or anything. They were independent researchers working off a government grant, and you could trust their opinion. But John Abramson published a book recently called Overdosed America, and he brings up in there that most of these people that are publishing these very supposedly great articles, you don't know whether to trust them or not. They get their foot in the pharmaceutical industry. They get their foot in the instrument, uh, in, in the industrial complex. You can totally uh, believe what they say. Not every time, but you've got to be suspicious. You've got to be open-minded. And it, in New England General of Medicine, matter of fact, they admit it. They could no longer uh, find doctors who, who could give true independent opinions. And that's really uh, uh, concerning, of course. Now, if, if a pharmaceutical company discovers a new drug, okay, to put, they bring it to the FDA to have it studied. Guess what? The pharmaceutical company has to pay half the fee for the study, and the government pays the other half. That makes great sense. The trouble is these two guys are making friends now. And uh, because the government is now involved and the pharmaceutical company is involved, guess what? That congressman is calling up and saying, would you hurry up and move this drug along? Uh, would you help my friend uh, with this pharma company? Yes, the politicians are getting uh, involved. And uh, John Abramson, in his very good book from Harvard, uh, brings this up. So corporate, corporate profits uh, 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 throughout the medical system, and it's very difficult today to decide really what to trust, what to trust. My vote motivation for Dr. Second Opinion, you know, I think I told it to you uh, uh, pretty much already. I went talking to the corporations, uh, but uh, my own thought process has changed. When I was born, I think my mother whispered in my ear, I should be a doctor. I watched her and her sister in Germany during the war uh, do all the medical care of a community. They were not doctors, they were midwives and, and, and a part nurse. I saw them operate in the living room without anesthesia or, or sterile condition or anything like that, do any major abscesses of the knees and shoulders. I saw all that as a child. So I always wanted to, to, to be a doctor, and I've always felt kind of altruistic. That's why at age 39, maybe uh, a bit older, maybe uh, significantly older, I still practice in medicine because I love it. I love it. I wouldn't give this up. I wouldn't give this up for anything. The uh, 
feeling I have for health care, you know, my altruistic feeling stopped leaving me a number of years ago uh, because I thought uh, too much was being done uh, to the patient. Let me give you an example. I saw a patient uh, that had had almost 100 injections over their back, and then she came to see me in uh, 13 MRIs over six years. Instead of saying, where do you hurt, I asked her, and what's going on in your life? She said, well, this started when I lost my 16-year-old daughter in an accident. Just think of the stress of that. And someone made a back case out of it, over 100 injections, over three different pain doctors, and they, then they addicted her to narcotics. I then started her on a wellness program, and I got a well with, with, uh, in the year. So uh, that was my motivation, uh, really, uh, towards uh, 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 wellness. Then I handed out Dr. Schindler's book, How to Live, 365 Days a Year. He was an internist from Chicago, and he wrote this uh, uh, book. Uh, and I handed out probably 5,000 copies uh, free over the years, uh, and uh, to educate the patient about their wellness. Uh, now I teach patients uh, with CDs, DVDs, books, TV show, uh, audio books, uh, all things that I have available to, to educate the patient. Physician means educator, so uh, teacher. So uh, this is what really uh, I try to do. So that's really a summary of my motivation. Let's go to the next subject a little bit. Placebo, you know, I mentioned that before. I will heal. It can be a pill. You believe it, 70% chance it'll work. A placebo can be a doctor. When I speak to some people and they realize I'm coming from the heart, uh, then I get a lot of them well, frankly, that way. Because they know, they know I mean it, and I, I care for them, that I love them, uh, and I can be a placebo. An accidental operation can be a placebo, or even a regular operation. I have seen people have major operations, and for about two or three months, they seem to be well. That's a placebo effect many times. It may have had nothing uh, to do uh, with what was done at, su at surgery. Yes, this indeed is true. It can be a major procedure. Uh, I had a patient uh, not too long ago myself. I've done it. Uh, he, he owned a factory, 35 employees, having leg pain all the time, MRI is negative. And finally he comes to see me one Friday and he says, Doc, if you don't do something, uh, I'm going to close my factory. And 35 people d don't have a job. Now that got my attention pretty well. And uh, so I said, well, I explore the nerve. Maybe there's a hidden disc. That can happen. I explored the nerve. I found nothing. Nothing. What did I say to the patient? Now I had to be a bit of a healer. I said, well, the nerve was swollen. I moved it over a little bit, and I took some pressure off it. You know what? By Monday, he was working. No pain. That's a placebo effect. So a, a well-intentioned procedure, even finding nothing, can indeed get a patient well on occasion. But you don't want to do that on a regular basis. But occasionally, even I'm forced to do it. But I've seen uh, patients who've had major fusions done when I thought they weren't indicated. For a couple of months, they seem to do pretty well. And then the mind breaks down and they're off and running, you know, with something else. That's the placebo. What about the nocebo? That's the opposite. I talked to 400 doctors and none of them know what nocebo meant. I never met a patient who knew what it meant. It's, it's not well known. I didn't even know it until I read about maybe six, seven years ago in a book on fibromyalgia. But it, it's how we speak to people, how we use diagnostic tests, MRIs, overread them, read more into them than there really is. And I tell you, and I don't mind saying it, radiologists, x-ray specialists are real good at it, describing every dinky little thing on an MRI scan that's a natural process of aging and making the family doctor looks at the report, the patient looks at the report, think there's something horribly wrong. I saw an elderly gentleman the other day and uh, three pages of dictation, uh, three pages of type like this, three pages, describing nothing but normal findings for an age 70-year-old, this arthritic spur, that little bulge here, every darn thing, and all the guys a numb fifth finger. And nothing to do with the problem. That's the nocebo. Let me give you a couple of case stories of the, of the uh, nocebo. I mean, it's frankly almost unbelievable. Uh, I know a patient had a brain tumor, and I know a surgeon that was telling me this story. Uh, and had come in with a small change on an MRI scan, and it looked uh, malignant. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, patient uh, 
uh, was told that this was a malignant tumor. And she said, well, how long I get to live? And he said, uh, six months, but no chance of hope. Never mentioned that 10% might do pretty good or do everything he could in his power to help them get in the 10%. He starts screaming. She screamed all night. Uh, next day, he biopsies the darn thing, comes back, tells her the same story. No hope. She screams louder. The next day, third day, she was dead. She was dead. How did that happen? This lady of, of, had four children, no, no husband. She was terribly stressed. You can understand it. it. That's like the voodoo effect. You believe and cause a fibrillary degeneration of the heart, and you could die. That's the, even the extension of the placebo. Or this, uh, give me another uh, example of a uh, nocebo. I saw a lady uh, a few months ago uh, coming to see me with low back pain. Uh, again, had a divorce a few months ago, threatened of losing her job, Went, goes to see her doctor. She has low back pain. Probably was fibromyalgia type thing, uh, but uh, he didn't interpret as such. Did an MRI. It shows the changes that you expect in an overweight person at age 45. You expect that four or five discs to be degenerated. Told her she needed a back operation. Sent her to me. She comes with a three-page x-ray report, all overread by the radiologist. Instead of saying this is consistent with age 45, uh, just, there's three pages of description. Uh, and uh, uh, I took a history. I said, what's going on in your life? I found out what's going on in her life. There's an awful lot of stress. And I said, it's fibromyalgia. She was no seaboat by her procedure, by her uh, uh, family doctor. But uh, be, to be honest with you, I'm sad to say, a lot of pain centers and, and surgeons of all stripes, not just back surgeons, especially seen in sinus surgery. I was uh, uh, reading an Abramson's uh, uh, book, uh, and uh, where actually I was reading Caldwell Esseltine's uh, book, where he uh, describes uh, that when they send an X-ray report on, on sinuses, he even, even uh, experimented with it. Send 10 patients out with a little bit of sinus, a little frontal headache, and, and, and all 10 came back, and they said they had sinusitis. They didn't have sinusitis. Somebody's overreading the, the uh, sinus X-rays. Incidentally, while I'm at it, the most common cause is headache in the facial area, sinus area. It's migraine headaches 90% of the time. Again, nothing to do with the dinky changes in your scan. But with, but results from that, there was a lot of procedures. A lot of, now they have scoping, so they have a little fancy equipment. They want to explore your sinuses for migraine headache. So you've got to watch out. Get another opinion. I hope you would understand by now what I mean by the nocebo. Negative talk about your studies when they have nothing to do with your problem. But it's tough for the patient to figure this out. That's why I'm writing this book on second opinion. So the placebo, nocebo, is very important in the second opinion business is what is on your diagnostic studies, your x-rays, CT, MRI, including angiogram, including angiogram, related to what you got. Is it related to what you have? Uh, it's just extremely important. It could be based, frankly, on laboratory studies. Is this abnormality they're talking about in your, in your blood related to your condition? Or is this just going to start a process of overstudying things uh, when it may not be needed. You see the importance of uh, second uh, opinions. Let's talk about specific illnesses where I think it's much more important uh, to get a second opinion. To me, the king of need for second opinion uh, is chronic pain. Chronic pain, yes. There is so much addiction going on in this country, it is beyond belief. The most common cause of death from a narcotic across the nation and in our counties here is a physician prescription, not the guys from Colombia or Mexico that are selling us drugs or providing the drugs. It's the prescription that is killing the most common cause of death from a narcotic. It is rampant out there. I'm sure you have a neighbor or friend who has a problem along this line. One of my best friend's daughter was, uh, died from a narcotic uh, overdose provided by a pain center. Uh, and uh, I don't see anybody do anything uh, about it. Uh, our law agencies uh, have not enforced the law uh, in this, this area very much. In Florida, they changed the law. I pointed this out to legislatures, to prosecutors, Nobody does anything. 
but our people are dying. I think it's time to do something. So what about pain? We have acute pain. You break something. Uh, the brain tells you where the break is at. It says it's in my wrist. It, it tells you where the pain is at. Uh, we may give a short-term narcotic. Uh, we put a cast on there. Six weeks later, it comes off, and we don't, it, we don't take narcotics anymore. It's an endpoint. You want an endpoint. That's 10% of the pain troubles. But 60%, but then 90% of pain, of chronic pain, uh, is that pain more than six months, uh, can be divided into a few different categories. One is nociceptive pain, that's 10%. Bursitis of the shoulder, tennis elbow, for example, th those uh, would be uh, a nociceptive pain, little arthritis in the knee, that's 10%, okay? Now we have neuropathic, that means nerve damage, sharp bites off your leg, you're gonna cut your nerve, the nerve is cut in half, so that's nerve pain, that's neuropathic pain, ruptured disc, trigeminal neuralgia, that, that is nerve pain. But that's only another 10%. That's been confirmed to me uh, by psychiatrists, uh, uh, so I, I'm pretty certain of the figure, it's 10% or less. But if you read some pain books, Emily Thurston's latest book on pain, she says it's 90%. Who is she kidding? Well, for one thing, she's not a doctor, and she hung out at six or seven pain centers, and somebody brainwashed this lady. 50 to 70% of the pain is, I've read three different pain books, they had no name for it. They try to call it neuropathic pain. But what does that pain do to? Anger, anxiety, fear, uh, depression. That's the cause of at least 50% of the pain problems. But when you go see the pain center of their physician, he does a nocebo, points out the normal process of aging on the MRI, and says that's the reason you have your pain. And now this patient who's having centralized pain, I don't call it sciatic pain, it's real pain. It's real pain, relates it to an x-ray study, does a nocebo, and then the nocebo of that study is used to start the addictive process. They inject it, they treat it, they work off of this thing. You go to a pain center, and the first thing you want to do is an injection. Now, why would that be? That's the key that unlocks the door to the next step, the narcotic. The patient that's looking for dopamine, they don't feel right. They have anxiety, fear, depression, real symptoms presenting itself as pain. Now there are narcotics. What do, what do narcotics do? They sensitize your brain cells and more sensitive, more sensitive, more sensitive, more narcotics. You know, first it's, it's uh, hydrocortone and, 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 and uh, then it, uh, maybe it's Tylenol 3 with uh, codeine and then it leads to oxycontin and then to fentanyl. Constantly escalating the thing and sensitizing your brain. That is what's happening because narcotics cause an overwhelming high, an overwhelming craving. They make you feel better. The whole world could use dopamine. In these economic times, we all could use some dopamine. But the darn trouble is the dopamine should come from exercise and laughter, your own endorphins, your own dopamine, your own morphine, not from external narcotics, which see your own endorphins are not addictive. But the narcotics uh, that externally supplied uh, are addictive. And now you become a drug addict. Now you become a drug addict. The hallways of a lot of pain centers, the people are lying in the floor of the hallway. I've seen it. Patients describe it to me. Patients describe it to me. So before they deal with your chronic pain, uh, a second opinion really is extremely important. But a lot of the people that is so craving uh, for uh, dopamine and, and narcotics, uh, they're not going to go seek a second opinion. I try to tell some of these uh, patients where it's anger, fear, and depression, they think it's their x-ray, and I tell them it's not their x-ray. You see, there's a centralized area of pain where the pain is largely located in the thalamus and the single gyrus, and there's a pr the, the uh, decentralized area, the spinal cord theory, of course, because uh, the providers want to talk about the spinal cord because that's where the procedures are, that's where the money is. That's where the injections are. That's where the facet blocks are. That's where they want to put instrumentation in there. Uh, th th there's no money to be made in the brain. You gotta talk to those people. You see the point? I'd like to put a name to this 50% uh, that, that it's not related to any study. I call it metabolic pain. I just picked a term. I have a chapter of that in my pain book. I published a book, Fraud of Chronic Pain. I face it head on. I think it's worth reading. Uh, 
uh, instead of uh, overdoing things to these people because people are dying. They're not only becoming addicted. They're dying from this stuff. So to seek a second opinion for chronic pain, I think is extremely important, but it's very difficult to do when you're already addicted to the drugs. And I beg the provider not to start narcotics unless it's acute pain. For chronic pain, you need to try other things, non-addictive medication, massage, uh, chiropractic, uh, uh, tai chi, qigong, uh, exercise, music, laughter. Try other ways, meditation. But don't hand them a narcotic. You're going to turn them into an addict. I see those patients every day. I don't mind seeing the patients. I know how to deal with them. I know to point them in the right direction. And it, it is not easy to get an addicted person to to listen to a CD or a DVD, it's difficult. Many of them, uh, frankly, are just sick and tired of it all and just quit and say, I never feel any good anyway. It's common for patients to tell me, narcotics, they don't help anyway, but they take them. They need that dopamine is, is the reason. Uh, so chronic pain problems are a huge uh, thing in, in society today. Uh, many of them uh, have been produced uh, by a, a attempt at a quick fix uh, the, the provider sees the patient and bang to the pain center. And I have in my book if, on, on fraud of chronic pain, if you were uh, to read it, patient stories in their own handwriting, how they've gone there and have uh, frankly been abused. There's so many injections and procedures that are just 10 pages long. And there's one gentleman I wrote a story in there and all I ever did is ask him to walk around the block and each, each week increase the length of his walk around the circle. And guess what? <laughs> he got well, there's something to work. And he sent me a big thank you letter, and that story is really in this book. This is not an uncommon thing. He didn't need huge magical stuff. Although uh, I teach mindfulness, and I have uh, Dr. Richard Johnson from St. Francis has a course uh, in uh, mindfulness at the Mind Body Institute. I have a Lutheran hospital uh, for chronic pain problems. About five or six talks and teaches you methods of getting off without medication to get rid of chronic pain. That's how it's done in Canada. That's how it's done in Massachusetts by Kobat Zen. This is a real, a real thing, but a patient must participate. And, uh, and I say, aren't we supposed to be healers? We're not supposed to be addictors or over-operators. Uh, but chronic pain is a great need for second opinion. If you do a box, you go to a pain center or uh, 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 some doctor's offices and they constantly want to inject you. Well, they, they get paid for that, I guess. Uh, but sometimes an injection is very helpful. You have cancer, one well, injection is great. But occasionally, uh, for other problems, an injection helps. Bursitis, it helps. Tendonitis, it can help. But you can always ask a second opinion. Would exercising my elbow, for example, or strengthening it, uh, avoid an injection? Yes, it does, because I have tennis elbow. I had it, but I uh, get over it through stretching, strengthening, and doing some uh, uh, push-ups. So there are other, uh, reasons for a second opinion. So epidural blocks, many patients I see, they come back didn't do any good or last a day or two. The occasional patient says it was great. Was it the placebo effect? You never know. As long as you believe, maybe it was the pleasure effect. And some things, of course, uh, they, they clearly help. So be careful to, you know, I see patients have 50 epidural blocks. And, uh, and uh, I saw a patient the other day in the hospital. Matter of fact, the last block she had, uh, I spent Friday night after I even went to Anderson, listened to that lecture, I came back. and, and uh, at my age 39, actually I did four operations. I had three on the schedule. But a fourth one was an abscess in the spine from an injection uh, at, a pain, at a pain center. He promptly referred the patient. He did everything that he could. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and she's going to be fine. But when I took her history the next day, she'd been to one pain doctor for 10 years that had 55 injections, she told me. And then she went to another uh, uh, pain center and the same process is starting over again. There is a diff there, it just is a different way. There can be a different opinion about it. I'm just giving you my opinion. And uh, uh, spinal implants, the same thing. Uh, yesterday, uh, one of the psychologists from a pain center attended one of my lectures on the mind body, and I wanted to thank her uh, for coming. We had a little bit of discussion. Uh, and she screens the patients who are going to have instrumentation placed in the spine, uh, stimulators and intrathecal injections and pumps and things like that. For cancer, good thing. Uh, uh, but to do it for chronic benign pain, I, I think it's questionable. It may have a, uh, a few patients, but remember, you get a monkey on your back when you get that. It constantly needs to be adjusted, and, and some people will claim it's a wonderful way of life, 
But you notice most of them are on disability. Maybe they were looking for that in the first place. I don't know. But you don't see a lot of perfectly well people who have a stimulator in their back. And that's worth getting a second opinion about. Uh, could other methods work? Could a wellness uh, program uh, uh, work? Uh, here's an interesting thought. The 70% that don't participate. When I gave my little talk in, in, in memory, we talked about Naples, Florida, and I talked to Scott, and Scott said, but, well, and you realize, Rudy, the reason I'm an instant wellness, and I'm an instant you providing wellness here, that, that 70% uh, of uh, the people don't participate in their health care. You probably don't believe this, but it's in the literature. It's in the literature. I told Scott, that may be true, they come to see you, but that's not true when they see me because I spend time with the patients. They realize I love them and care about them. I don't care if you're 100 years old. I don't care if you're a prisoner. I, I will treat you the same, and you will feel, uh, you feel that I care about you. I don't care who you are, uh, and, uh, and you will realize that, and I can motiv motivate a lot higher group of people, and I think providers need to be trained in motivation, how to motivate somebody. But of course, that's not in the test in med school. They don't teach motivation there. How do you motivate somebody to wellness? I wrote a book on that, 38 chapters. I mean, there's a million ways to motivate somebody, but I try to put about 38 ways together. The start, though, is with the love of the provider. That's a heck of a, a good start. Uh, and but I suggest to you, instead of having it, the quick fix, that you seek other opinions and say, can I get well if I, say, lose 20 pounds, get rid of my diabetes, for example, or if I exercise more? Or if I take a walk every day and lose a little bit of weight, do I need this heart operation, this angioplasty? Uh, do I need this gallbladder removed? Uh, after all, I'm feeling pretty good now, and I'm not 100% certain that that uh, is a, my, a gallbladder. I mean, you get big attacks, and they're putting you in bed, and you vomit vomiting your guts out. Maybe it's your gallbladder. Uh, but these, a lot of times, indications uh, here are, are, are borderline. The same with removing uh, the uterus or things. We'll talk about organs a little later in the need for a removal or not. Uh, but uh, participate in your health care. Ask, how could I get well on my own? Don't just jump at the quick uh, uh, fix. And uh, how do you motivate someone to wellness? It's not easy. I'll name my top ten. Uh, uh, number one is, uh, uh, frankly, if you can uh, convince a patient to eat different food, that gets uh, probably 90% of the people with vast disease get them well. Uh, also, uh, if you... Uh, point out to them if they don't do something there could be life-changing events. You could die. You could be paralyzed. Uh, you have to be on medication permanently. So that might be one way to point out a type 2 diabetic. They're going to go blind, lose their legs, uh, have heart attack, unannounced heart attacks. Th that might motivate them. Uh, uh, and to show them the pictures, that can be motivating. Uh, uh, sh sometimes I ask them to visualize uh, what, what might happen if they don't do it. And I present the visualization to them. Uh, that can be helpful. Uh, another way to commit people uh, is to uh, have to make a commitment. Write it down. I'm, I'm committed to lose 30 pounds of weight in six months. Ask them to visualize what they're going to look like in six months. That can be motivating. Your subconscious mind starts to go to work. Remember what I said? There's a doctor living within you, so we can put uh, him to work. Power of positive thinking. Uh, if you uh, can convince a patient to think positively instead of negatively about their own health, that can be uh, motivating. And to teach them the mind-body connection, what the mind can do to their body, uh, then to be, begin to realize their thought process, how they think, how they eat, uh, is causing some of these conditions. That can be uh, motivating. And the will to live. Uh, ask the patient, you know, they want to live to be 100? Well, they want to live, to, I commonly ask people, do you want to live to be 100? Yes, I want to live to be 100. Well, then you have to do something. And, and this, then I write down for them what they, what they need to do. That can be uh, motivating. Uh, and. Uh, uh, meditative techniques can be used to motivate people to quiet the mind so they're less uh, stressful, get rid of the pain. That can be uh, uh, motivating. And uh, some patients, I treat them uh, Tai Chi, Qigong, I send them to the wellness studio, uh, Zumba dancing, ballroom dancing, uh, all these methods uh, of uh, starting to get people well and motivating them uh, towards uh, wellness. You start slow and say, yeah, you lost two pounds, great, and uh, it can be motivating. And to, for them to establish a purpose in life. I think this is a big thing. Uh, here I am at age 39, uh, having a wonderful time. I got a purpose. I get a lot of people well. Every three days, somebody walks out to me and says, 
uh, wants me to take the picture because they no longer have type 2 diabetes and they lost a lot of weight. You ought to see my cell phone. Man, I get zillions of pictures in there, people, before and after. Uh, they love it. It's motivating to them. I show them uh, these pictures. So I have a purpose of getting people well. Uh, I count, today I saw a patient. Uh, he, uh, quite elderly, uh, he told me he had made uh, uh, 25 uh, models uh, of the Christmas scene, and he was going to give it to his church, to the children, to the first graders. They have a school there. Uh, this Christmas, he already has 50 retta. He's going to give them to a, a private uh, high school uh, because his wife teaches there. So I gave him a bigger vision. I said, next year, I want you to make 100, and I want you to go to the inner city Y and provide it for the inner city children. He said he would do it. He has a purpose. Do you think that guy's going to be alive in the next year? I guarantee it. He has a purpose in life. And I'd be there when he presents these uh, 100 uh, 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 religious scenes. And uh, let's talk a minute about disappearing organs and body parts. It, you wouldn't think uh, that a person uh, could turn down a heart transplant and be alive 15 years later. Yes, my patient Max Honeywell came to see me. He was told he needed a heart transplant in Indianapolis. Uh, and uh, I saw him at the lake. And, uh, and uh, I knew the work of Dr. Dean Ornish, one of the original people to publish works on heart disease as stoppable, preventable, and reversible. Sort of just like Esseltine, who was just a little bit later than that. I knew his CDs and DVDs and books. And I, and I, uh, uh, I gave them to my, to my uh, friend. And guess what? 15 years later, Max Honeywell uh, is send me, text me, send me a picture uh, standing on a roof in Marion, Indiana, building houses. Now, what do you say? Now, there was a second opinion worth getting. Even in the heart transplant business, would you uh, uh, believe it? Now, there would have been a disappearing organ. Instead, he still has his own heart. Now, I bet if we angiogrammed him, you'd find, uh, according to the work of Esseltine and, and Ornish, you'd find those arteries are a lot cleaner today because they, they find that uh, they clean themselves out about it. If you need a nutrient-dense diet, about 5% a year. Dr. Joel Furman thinks the percentage is a lot higher than, uh, uh, than that. I mean, very uh, uh, interesting. The gallbladder, another example. Uh, there's no click a test, a test and, uh, that says your blood sugar is 800 and you're diabetic. You know, it's a matter of attacks and you have to trust the person doing it. But I, to get a second opinion, I think probably uh, sometimes it's not, not a bad idea. The same with the uterus. We all know from history that they used to take out every uterus. We also know uh, from history they used to whack off the whole breast. You hate to say it in those terms. Halstead procedure uh, no longer uh, is indicated for every breast uh, cancer. So cancer uh, is worth getting a second opinion. There are honest differences of opinion about it. You go to IU, you go here, you, you go to Cleveland Clinic, Mayor Clinic, you're going to get different advice. So it's worthwhile. Look at the internet. It's worthwhile. You may learn some things. Uh, maybe even internet in Europe, but you got to watch out. You don't get somebody scamming you too. So, but gathering uh, uh, multiple opinions, you know, is uh, 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 quite uh, important. But but even in in other procedures like polyps and things that they want to remove, you know, for example, right now, the, the uh, according to studies, they're not recommending you get scoped. I saw that in the paper getting scoped beyond age 75. If you had a scope in the last few years, uh, to, to get another one at age 75. Uh, long-term studies prove it has very little value. So uh, I don't say don't follow that. I say study that, get another opinion about it. Is that true, doctor? I'm not making a recommendation here. Uh, I'm just saying uh, I'm starting to read about that. Uh, and uh, are they just trying to save money, or is that actually true? Uh, that, that was out of the literature. So to, uh, do I really need this uh, uh, prostate surgery or this radiation or even a PSA that's done the question is it worth got, well, well, getting a blood test for the, for the PSA Jeez. I mean uh, I wouldn't think it's necessarily a good idea but, but studies are starting to show uh, maybe it's not necessary beyond a certain age uh, so if they're going to take away one of your organs uh, I think uh, I'd uh, you know get a second opinion about it uh, you can't re replace that uh, and uh, I think it's uh, uh, a pretty important uh, thing. Fortunately, we don't do brain transplants yet, <laughs> so I don't assume they'll take my brain out anytime soon, although I'm sure some people would like to. <laughs> You've got to have a little humor here. And uh, 
uh, it was so like I was, I was at McDonald's getting a cup of coffee there, and uh, my cat had scratched my nose. So, uh, and, and the guy says, "What you need is a cat scan." <laughs> okay. Then I saw a beautiful black lady, very gorgeous, perfect figure, and uh, and I asked her how that accomplished because I had seen in some of my weight classes, and I noticed she really lost weight. I said, "How'd you do that?" He says, "How'd you get it accomplished?" That just I avoid whites, <laughs> white bread, white flour. <laughs> okay. We need a little humor here. Uh, weight reduction surgery. Let's talk about that a little bit here. I mean, it's very effective. I mean, at Lufen Hospital, uh, 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 we have a doctor there. I mean, he's good at it. No deaths one year. No deaths. And, uh, and uh, that didn't mention, I'm sure, he had a little complication. No surgeon has no complications. And he's a wonderful doctor. I really love that doctor. And uh, uh, very, very effective. But then again, you know, you ought to think about it. If I, I were to follow the nutrient-dense diet recommended by Dr. Cashman, I wouldn't need that surgery. And do we know, uh, once they do a little bypass on you, what phytochemicals you are not absorbing in your body? Is the aging process going to be the same 30, 40 years from now? We don't have the answers to that, although uh, the weight reduction surgery can be very effective. I've had seen people of this doctor who, who's di type 2 diabetes, gone, matter of months. But why did you eat too much to begin with? So it's probably you using food as a drug. You still got that disease. So just because you weigh a bit less, you still got that disease. And odds are you'll develop, you may, you may develop other things uh, to substitute for this, what we we're using as a psychological crutch because you're not getting the chemicals of food to your, brain, to your brain now because not all the food is absorbed. It's passing out in your stool. So you're different psychologically. And, uh, and one of the problems, I think, with the weight reduction surgery, they, they're using scopes now. They're good at it. They're so darn good at it. What I'm afraid of is going to become so popular, it'll be the most popular operation in the nation. Look at the expense. We don't, still don't know the real long-term effects, uh, and uh, we didn't really, really cure the problem totally. We're not taking some of those phytochemicals, 25,000 of them that you need for good health. You're not absorbing them. They're going out in your stool. And I will bet you down the line we'll find out things uh, that we may not like to hear. That's, that's my educated guess on the matter. So to get a second opinion and to consider maybe uh, a way of eating instead of an operation, and especially if this, this procedure, because it's, it's getting so good uh, that it could devastate the nation economically uh, and the people in the long run, and not totally cure the condition to, uh, to begin with, the cost involved, uh, and there's, there's risk. What do you think the anesthetic risk of a four, 500-pound patient on the operating table? I've watched that surgery. It is frightening. But in spite of that, the people are so skillful there, they get most of the people through it. Uh, but uh, uh, you're, taking, uh, you're taking a risk, especially anesthetic risk. Can you imagine resuscitating a 400-pound individual? Uh, I mean, it's, it's very difficult. Let's talk about osteoporosis for a minute. You know, everybody thinks osteoporosis, all women get it because the estrogen goes down, uh, and they develop osteoporosis. They fall down, they break their bones, right? It's the estrogen, correct? And it's old age, uh, correct? Well, that happens to be wrong. The most common cause, actually, of osteoporosis is people who eat a protein diet, meat protein diet, not, not protein from plants. Uh, and what, what this does, it makes the blood so acidic, so acidic if you eat a bunch of steaks, uh, that calcium is leached out of the bones to neutralize the blood, to neutralize the blood, to bring it back to, uh, to uh, equality. And, uh, to, uh, and that is the biggest cause of Big time meat eaters have osteoporosis. I see in men, I saw a man yesterday, 50 years old, a whole bunch of compression fractures uh, but because he's affecting his bone structure by smoking, alcohol, and high protein, high protein uh, diet. So he, to eat a plant-based diet uh, is very important uh, to avoid uh, osteoporosis. Think about that uh, uh, a bit. Compression fractures are quite common, uh, and I see a lot of them. A significant number of women get them much higher than men, but men get them too. But men get them too. So think of diet as an approach to it, uh, and the medications have a lot of side effects. Study the side effects. Uh, and of course, taking some vitamin D and some fish oil, things like that, can, can help 
uh, you remain healthy, but uh, your osteoporosis problem is not going to be solved by medication. High dense nutrient diet, and the last thing is exercise. We develop sarcopenia. Sarcopenia, what's that? Weak muscles. And, and, it, it's, and it's very big cause of, matter of fact, after Joe Furman, who wrote a famous book, Eat to Live, Nutrient Way of uh, Eating, uh, he would say sarcopenia is the biggest cause of osteoporosis. So to strengthen your muscles, very important, especially uh, in women. Uh, we can double and triple our muscular strength into our 90s. We can only improve our VO2 max from our heart, maybe stay even, uh, no matter what we do. But a muscle, to improve our muscle mass is a number one marker of proper aging. So re remember that. You want to avoid osteoporosis, eat the right food, exercise regularly, uh, uh, vitamin D, maybe a multivitamin, uh, and uh, uh, that can help uh, osteoporosis. Uh, how do I know that? Well, in, in Africa, uh, in China, where they were eating a planned diet uh, years ago, no osteoporosis, no compression fractures. They moved to the United States, same, and it's not a racial thing. It's not a racial thing, not different between black and white, sir. Uh, it, it's not. It's the food they're eating. It's the food they're eating. Uh, so it's very important uh, to eat uh, the right uh, uh, food. Let's talk about a little bit here about uh, diabetes and cardiovascular disease. If you go to uh, the doctor and you say, I have type 2 diabetes, and he says, here's your pill, see you later, and you're overweight, don't accept it. Get a second opinion. If you get to a normal body mass index, you know what's going to happen? You have type 2 diabetes, 90% of the time in 60 days, it's gone. I hardly ever meet a patient who says that he knew type 2 diabetes is curable or, or that what insulin resistance is, which is the cause of type 2 diabetes. Uh, I, I never, hardly ever meet a patient that knows that. And to me, that's kind of sad. Maybe pathetic would be a good word because it's a curable uh, disease. It's the same as vascular disease. Dr. Esseltein, uh, last Friday, uh, when he lectured in his church in Anderson, uh, Indiana, I said vascular disease, and Dr. Fremer will say the same, Dr. McDougall will say the same, Hans Steele will say the same, Bernard will say the same, uh, that vascular disease is preventable 90% of the time. So before they run at you with angioplasties and all sorts of things, ask the doctor, could I follow a nutrient way of eating, exercise, practice stress reduction, participate in my health care? Could I avoid this cardiac bypass surgery? Could I avoid this uh, angioplasty? If you're dying for peace's sake, have these things done. But, but if it's an elective situation, you ought to get a second opinion and consider that or listen to this opinion in the first place or read the books that I've written on reversing type 2 diabetes and, uh, and, uh, and vascular disease. So really, in summary, uh, I would say uh, to get a, you can get a second opinion, frankly, almost about anything. The honest differences opinion about everything that I've mentioned. I, I, I respect that, but I want you to make the choice. I want you to decide what risk to take, and I want you to participate in your health care, and I want uh, uh, you uh, uh, to do something uh, about your health instead of the quick fix, we do it, we get paid for it, but you're not cured. I can cure you. I can cure you by eating the proper diet and, and through exercise. Thank you very much for listening uh, to this uh, discussion of Dr. Sutton's opinion. This is the second DVD. I think I plan to have a third, and I'm going to have a guest, I think, Dr. Donald Reed, a trauma surgeon at Lufthansa Hospital, an excellent physician. I'm going to bring him along and ask, get a second opinion from him. Thank you very much. Uh, namaste.